All right, Bio2 students, um, welcome back. Hope everyone's uh, doing okay and making the best out of uh, the scenario we're in now. We're going to um, sort of like go over to where we uh, left off, I believe, and I'll give you more information to come in terms of, of what to expect as far as evaluation-wise, testing-wise. But um, I want to get some content up and and get this uh, ball rolling again in terms of the delivery of information and, and what you can be studying. So let's talk about plant diversity at um, somewhere in the middle of unit one before. Uh, we're just gonna put all that on pause and we're gonna start a new unit called unit two and I'm gonna move that up. So this is plant diversity and we'll come on over to this screen here and you can follow along with what you have in your PowerPoint. So we talk about plant diversity. Um, we kind of mentioned some of this already in person in lecture, uh, but now that we're back um, doing it online, I'm gonna go through these again in through each group. We were talking about mosses, I think last time we did the um, life cycle of mosses, but we're gonna cover that again. So if you look at plant evolution, uh, plants uh, probably evolved from green algae around 475 million years ago, right about, you know, there or so. And there are a bunch of evolutionary events. Um, and again, these splits represent one group uh, splitting from another, resulting in different um, larger, say, phyla now, or in this case, probably divisions of these. So we'll talk about each of these groups um, and vascular and non-vascular plants as we go. So once again, this is somewhat of a repeat probably of what we've already seen once, but when we talk about plants, one thing that's always, that comes up really quick is we have to talk about this um, alternation of generation um, where there's both a multicellular haploid and multicellular diploid stage um, of the organism. Again, that's different than humans where we do have a haploid stage, but it's one single cell. Um, in these plants, uh, they have a whole organism that is haploid. And we'll call these different um, divisions. Um, and, and the different um, divisions uh, are the same as phyla. Remember the plant people and the fungi people do their sort of own thing than the animal people. And so instead of phyla, they call their branchings divisions. And we'll put all these in the same kingdom which is plantae. So the domain eukarya, the kingdom plantae, and we have our non-vascular seedless plants first, which includes bryophyta, hepatophyta, and, and serophyta, which are mosses, liverworts, and hornworts. And then we have our vascular plants, which are the lycophyta, xylophyta, sphenophyta, and the horsetail is called um, this, I'm sorry, Ooh, whoops, whoopsie. Okay, no, there we go, the sphenophyta, which are our horsetails. And then we'll talk about our terophyta, which are our ferns. So we'll go through each of these. And remember that when we're talking about um, the, um, these plants and this alternation of generation, we're talking about this idea that there's a haploid and diploid, multicellular um, diploid and haploid stage. So we call the multicellular haploid stage, the gametophyte stage, that's one set of chromosomes, and then the sporophyte stage is two sets of chromosomes. So in the gametophyte stage, then since it's one set, the organism can be, um, have structures on it that are mainly male, which produce sperm um, in the non-vascular seedless plants, or they can be uh, female, and that's the equivalent of producing eggs. So that's the antheridium, which are the male structures and the surrounding protective structures that produce what we call sperm. And those then are different than the gametophyte stage that is um, female. And we define female here as those that produce the egg. And the archegonium then produces the egg, but it's also the protective structures around the egg if they're there, such as paraphyses and things like that. Then we have on the sporophyte, we have the sporangium and the sporangium produces spores. 
So we'll start with our first group, the hepatophyta, and those are the liverworts, and they come in two types. They can either be leafy or they can be thalloid. The leafy type, which is the more common one, 80% um, of them that you see over here, have structures that sort of look like little leaves on them, and then the thalloid type are these flat type here. And in lab, we'll see this structure here, um, which is the sporophyte stage, which has spores inside of it. And that's what you see here on the bottom of the liverwort. This thing's attached and that has the spores inside and it, and it ruptures and shoots the spores out all over the place. Um, the hepatophytes also have, which are liverworts once again, also can reproduce asexually using these structures called gemma cups. And the gemma cups are um, asexual reproduction mechanisms by which they um, produce copies of themselves. And when the water splashes into these, it shoots the spores out. Um, to me, this is interesting because the evolution of these organisms um, are before we see insects. So later on, we'll see seeds and other animals distribute spore-like structures in the evolutionary uh, fossil record. But this is way before any of that happens. And so these are very much have to rely on things like wind and rain. Um, so in this case, it's rain hitting them. Then we have the Enserophyta next. Uh, they are similar to liverworts, um, except for this big sporophyte that sticks out like that. And they're probably most closely related to land plants. And then we get to our bryophyta, which are the mosses. And again, most people know what a moss is. And if you don't, you can go outside your house, uh, maybe by your, um, your water faucet on the outside, your um, hose bib out there, and where the water leaks a little bit, sometimes you'll see some green algae type looking things. And quite often those are mosses. So um, what you normally need to do is to be able to know the life cycle of a um, bryophyte or a moss. And normally I would draw this up here like this. I'm going to put this up. I'm going to draw this later on and show you. But same drawing we had before um, where we have meiosis and we have 2N and we have N. And then we put different structures as we go like that. Um, I'll put a drawing up of that up next. And, and show you what you need to know. Um, I like to keep them kind of similar looking. So what you'll, what you'll need on this one that's particularly important is that the male gametophyte will have the antheridium on them. And then the female gametophyte will have the archegonium on them. And so these are different um, phalloids or different plant-like structures, separate organisms, but each is haploid. So the males produce sperm, which travel to the egg and fertilize the egg and result in this growing out. So this is the female gametophyte here. And this right here is the sporophyte growing out. And the sporophyte, of course, can produce spores. Now, next we get into the vascular seedless plants. And uh, you might remember me mentioning that the difference between vascular and non-vascular is the presence of vascular tissue, which in plants is xylem and phloem. So we'll talk more about these later on, but xylem is generally used to transport water um, in the plant, and the phloem is generally used to transport food. So anything that has true leaves, roots, and stems on it has xylem and phloem in them. And botanists are pretty particular about what they let be called a leaf or root or stem. So we'll say they're leaf-like or root-like or stem-like, um, but there's a bit of, uh, there's a bit of touchiness there that botanists don't want you to quite um, call something a leaf or root or stem, unless it has those structures in it. They also have lignin, which will probably be new to us here, and that's a chemical that is found in the cell wall in addition to um, the cellulose, which is commonly found in the cell wall. The lignin helps, um, uh, plants that are, or, or cells that are lignified, that cell wall is even tougher. So lignin is a, is a carbohydrate-like chemical that sort of links in more of the cell wall together and it makes it tougher. Um, so that's lignin. And then sporophyte generation dominant means that 
the most of what you see in the plant or most of what you see in that stage is sporophyte generation dominant, meaning that most of it is diploid. Most of it will be to N. And they also have a sperm with flagella that allow it to move from one place to another. Then we have the lycophyta uh, next, and the lycophyta look like these right here. Okay, uh, they have true leaves on them. That's our um, one thing they've got right there. Uh, they have microphiles, uh, usually a spine-shaped leaf. Um, we call these the microphiles because they're, they're kind of small and they're, they're sort of spine-legged and, and they have a single vein usually down the middle, but they do have true leaves because they have xylem and phloem in them. They also have true stems and they have true roots. And then at the very top up here, you have sporophylls and the sporophylls are specialized leaves that are gonna be used to produce spores. Then we have the xylophyta, uh, which do have true stems, but do not have true leaves or true roots. So this is the stem here. And other than that, you can't see much other than the green stick-like structure uh, because they don't have true leaves or true roots. So this is the xylophyta. Then we have the sphenophyta, and the sphenophyta um, are what we call horsetails. Uh, they have true leaves, true stems, and true roots. You find them often growing in soggy, water-like conditions um, in, the, in the little nodes right here where you have the microphiles, which are the small leaves. Um, the stems often will have silica in them, which is a glass-like uh, material. And then we get into the terophyta, and the terophyta then are our ferns. And ferns have been around a very long time. And once again, we're, we're kind of moving more into things that are more familiar to you, hopefully. So a fern is something now you can go to Home Depot or Lowe's and buy, or a plant store and go, hey, I need a fern. And you can go buy yourself a nice sporophyte generation version of a fern. And if you look on the bottom of the fern, you can see these little tiny uh, dots. And the little tiny dots that you see there um, are called a sori. Or a single one is called a soris. So sori is plural. It's a bunch of them together. And you'll look at that whole thing and it'll be covered up. And then if you were, they have a little cover on it called the inducium, which you'll learn in lab. And if you pull the inducium off underneath the inducium are the little tiny sporangia, or sporangium is one, and the sporangium produces spores, which then go on to make this structure here, which is called the prothallus. That's not good at all. Let me try, okay? Prothallus, there we go. And the prothallus, has this little spot on it here called the apical notch. And the apical notch is where you can determine where the female gametophyte is, which is right there. So that's my female gametophyte, which will have on it the archegonium. And then my male gametophyte, the antheridium, will be down here. So the sperm from the antheridium fertilizes the egg on the archegonium, most likely, um, I'm going to guess, from a different prothallus. So the problem with all these kinds of pictures is they show you a nice life cycle of one thing. But in general, in, in most living things, um, reproducing with itself is usually a no-go. You know, usually you end up with, um, um, not increasing your genetic diversity. And so most things don't go that route. Um, there are ways they do it in terms of timing and genetics. So um, although it's in one picture here, it's probably not true that this antheridium will fertilize that archegonium. Um, but we, we draw it on the life cycle like that to make it simple. Otherwise you'd have to have two of them at the same time, okay? But gives you a good idea of what's to come.